Like many of you, I've been inspired by Dr. Fauci's incredible dedication as a scientist, physician, and leader for our country during the COVID-19 pandemic. Since 1984, Dr. Fauci has served as an advisor to six American presidents, helping to navigate the federal response to AIDS, Ebola, the Zika virus, and anthrax scares. In 2008, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by George W. Bush for leading the fight against HIV AIDS. His AIDS relief plan is credited with saving millions of lives and bringing dying communities across the globe back to life. Dr. Fauci's straightforward, honest delivery of the scientific facts have contributed to his reputation as the most trusted public health figure of our times. But it's also his compassion that has endeared him to the American people. In 2014, Dr. Fauci donned a protective plastic suit and entered the isolation unit of the National Institutes of Health to personally treat the sickest Ebola patients our nation had ever seen. For weeks, he led by example dedicating two hours a day to treating a U.S. healthcare worker who had been infected with the disease in Sierra Leone. He is shown here famously hugging Texas nurse Nina Pham after she recovered from Ebola under his care. It reminds me of our vision of treating patients as we would our own loved ones. Dr. Fauci has been there for our country in all of these tumultuous times over the decades, and I am proud and humbled that he's here with GBMC Healthcare today. Wonderful, Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Dr. John Chassar, I'm a pediatrician and the president of the GBMC Healthcare System in Baltimore. We are so grateful for your time. We know how busy you are you have been such a beacon of reason uh, during the discourse of the pandemic. Uh, we wanna thank you. You've brought hope uh, to everyone in our community. So again, thank you. Um, we share some things together and I'd love to go off on those tangents. I too am an, an, a, an Italian American from the New York metropolitan area. I, grew up on the other side of the Hudson in New Jersey, been here for about 10 years. And I also have a love of espresso. And uh, I was gonna challenge you to a race, but then my team said, shut up, you'll lose, uh, because I know you're a runner and I'm kind of a plotter. But um, thank you again for spending some time with us. It's particularly meaningful to us because Friday, October 2nd is the 55th anniversary of the GBMC healthcare system. So uh, our clinical teams, our board of directors, and our uh, loyal supporters from the community will be watching our uh, discourse and they have submitted questions in advance. So uh, without further ado, I know how busy you are. Let me start with uh, a few uh, questions that we'd like to get your opinion on. The first one is we're now, um, nine months or so into the pandemic. And we'd love to know your thoughts about what do you think we've learned, both positive and negative, about our response to the pandemic that may put us in a better place for the next novel infection that comes our way? Well, I think the thing that we've learned is that as much as we thought we were prepared for pandemic, you know, we we had pandemic preparedness uh, exercises and facilities and supplies and a whole variety of things that had us be judged, you know, by the Hopkins Institute as the best prepared country for a pandemic. But the one thing we've learned is that you get surprised by different ways that things emerge. I mean, I always get asked what your worst nightmare would be, uh, what keeps you up at night. I've gotten asked that over the years now, several times, because people know that a lot of my career is associated 
with responding to outbreaks like HIV, Ebola, Zika, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea of having uh, emergence of a new virus from an animal species that has two characteristics, that when they come together, even the best preparedness has trouble with it, and that is a virus that is spectacularly efficient in its ability to transmit from person to person, and number two, one that has a high degree of morbidity and mortality, particularly if it's like either generally, which thankfully it isn't in this case, but a high degree of morbidity and mortality in vulnerable groups like the elderly and those with underlying conditions. So we've learned a bunch of things. We've learned that we didn't realize in the beginning that there was a degree of asymptomatic spread uh, that we now know occurs. There's, you know, maybe 40 to 40 percent, 40 to 45 percent of people who are infected are without symptoms and a substantial proportion of the actual transmissions that occur, occur from an asymptomatic person to a person who's uninfected. So the idea about the classic contact tracing, identification, isolation, and contact tracing uh, does not work very well. Um, in, in, inherently, it's, it's made more difficult by the asymptomatic carriage, but also we were not as well prepared with the, with the workforce to do the contact tracing, with the PPEs that were available. You know early on our, our diagnostic tests were disappointing. Uh, those are all things that you don't want to point blame to anyone, but you learn your lesson that those things have to be up and running and ready to go if you have an outbreak of the force and the capability of this outbreak. If you just have an outbreak that's an outbreak of curio curiosity and you don't have the explosion that we've seen now with 30 million cases worldwide and a million deaths and 200,000 deaths in the United States with 7 million cases, even in the exercises that you do, you would not have predicted things would be this bad. So you've really got to expect the worst uh, because it could happen. And unfortunately for us, it's happened. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. Um, let me move on to the probably the hottest uh, topic of conversation, which is the vaccine. Um, what's your best guess about when we will have an FDA approved uh, vaccine or two that would be that will be effective? And uh, we'd also love to hear your thoughts about the uh, industry's ability to pump out a significant number of doses so that we can uh, get the American people uh, immunized. Okay, two, obviously, of the most important questions. So the United States government has made investments to the tune of billions of dollars in taking the lead in trying to coordinate what are now six candidate vaccines that are in various stages of clinical trial using three separate platforms. Five of those are already in phase three trial. So let's just take a couple of them as prototype. You don't know which one is gonna be the best one of any of them, but you know the Moderna product, which is an mRNA, and the Pfizer, which is also an mRNA, started phase three on July 27th. So given the rate of infection that we currently have in the country, the distribution of the clinical trial sites, which are hundreds of them, and the fact that the trials are anywhere from 30,000 people to 44,000 to the Johnson, Johnson J&J &J trial, which started uh, in September, uh, of 60,000 people, we project that we'll get an answer as to whether we have a safe and effective vaccine by November or December. It is conceivable, though I think unlikely, but not impossible, that we could have that answer in October, the month we're in right now, today being October the 1st. So let's say, give yourself some cushion that it's November and December. Given the data that I've seen on the phase one studies of inducing robust levels of neutralizing antibodies 
and the favorable data from animal studies, I have said many times, and I'll say it to your group, that I feel cautiously optimistic that we will have one or more vaccines that are in fact safe and effective to a satisfactory degree. I don't know what that number is going to be, whether it's going to be 70%, 80%, 90%. We hope for the best, but I think we will pass the, the points that were made in the protocol to declare efficacy. And as I said, we should know that even though there's no guarantee, but I'm cautiously optimistic we'll know that by November and December. So let's say that happens. What the government has done is made investments in the production of vaccine doses way before we knew or know or will know whether the vaccine is safe and effective. So even as you and I are speaking right now, tens of thousands of doses are being produced with the goal at the end of this, in the total of all of the companies that the government is now involved with, to have about 700 million doses. Remember, most of these uh, vaccines are prime boosts. So that's, well, J&J or Janssen is a single dose, but most of them are two doses, which means that you're gonna need about 700 million doses if you wanna vaccinate everybody in the country with a prime and a boost. Right now, the vaccines that have been produced would be ready to vaccinate a proportion of people, namely the most vulnerable, at the in the middle of December, the beginning of January, February, and there'll be more and more and more. But I would imagine, and I think this is what, I don't think, but I know this is what we're being promised by those who are making the, the doses available, that if we have a vaccine that's safe and effective, we can start vaccinating healthcare providers who are on the front line and putting themselves at risk, as well as the vulnerable people, namely the elderly and those with underlying conditions that predispose them to a serious outcome. Bottom line, we could begin vaccinating people before the end of this calendar year. Excellent, thank you so much. That's uh, very hopeful. And then obviously we need to not drop our guard in the interim. Uh, a projection towards herd immunity and the, I'll put you on the spot now. Uh, everybody wants to know when they can uh, stop wearing their mask. Any uh, thoughts about when we would not only get an effective vaccine or two out there, but get to the point where we might be able to start uh, reducing social distancing and the wearing of masks? Well, you know, unfortunately, Dr. Chessar, I don't <laughs> think that's going to be in a few months. And I'll tell you why. Because even if we have a vaccine, let's say it's 75% effective. That means that even if everybody takes the vaccine, 25% of the people are not going to be protected. The other issue is that we have a big anti-vax approach and um, feeling in this country that in the last survey, the number of individuals who said that they would get vaccinated with a COVID-19 vaccine dropped from 70% down to 51% or 52%. So we don't know what herd immunity is, what the percentage is. A lot of people guess and it becomes dogma. We don't know. It could be 70%, it could be 80, it could be 60. I don't know what it is, but let's assume it's 75% of the population protected either from already being infected and or having a vaccine. I think by the time we get there, it's gonna be well into the end of this year before that occurs. So I don't think people are gonna be able to get rid of the masks and not worry about social distancing and avoiding crowds until we get into the third quarter or fourth quarter of 2021. And again, if we have one cycle of people continuing to get vaccinated, I think at the end of one year, we will be close to normal. 
I don't think we could just throw caution to the wind and say, not worry about it at all. But as we get into the next year, I think we'll be close to being where we want to be with normality. If all of these things hold out, namely, people get vaccinated, the vaccine is highly effective, and people do the public health preventive measures as we are getting to herd immunity, as opposed to assuming that as soon as the vaccine is on the market, everybody can do what they want to do, which would be very dangerous. Thank you so much. So uh, another question is, uh, we we are doing fairly well in Maryland with uh, the number of people sick enough to be in the hospital. And we've also seen fewer patients making it to the intensive care unit, which has been raising the question, is that uh, more because of uh, knowing using remdesivir and steroids early on, or is it possible, and we've seen some recent reports, at least uh, in the media, about the virus mutating. Yeah. Have you seen evidence that there is actually changes in the virus? Yeah, uh, there is a clear demonstration now uh, I'll explain the mutation, but I'm not so sure that that's the reason why you're seeing the diminution in hospitalizations and intensive care. I'll get back to that in a sec. But regarding the mutation, there's now a dominant strain out there that's a little different than the original strain. It has a mutation at amino acid number 614 with a G to a D, which means that this particular amino acid mutated and in vitro that has been shown to be much more able to bind to the receptor and the ability to infect cells in culture is markedly increased. In addition, in some ferret studies uh, or small animal studies, I believe they were ferret or guinea pig, I'm not sure, I think it was ferret, they showed that the transmission among them seemed to be greater than the wild type virus. It's still not definite proof that the virus is transmitted more efficiently. But the important part, it had nothing to do with the virulence. So we don't think it's any less virulent or more virulent. The only mutation that people feel is going to have a functional significance is a mutation that has to do with ease of transmissibility, not virulence. So I don't think that explains your experience of less hospitalizations, I think, or less deaths. I think it's more that the people who are getting infected now are in a younger group. The new infections in September, October of this year are being driven by people 19 to 25, 30 years old, as opposed to an older group. They tend to have less of a chance of being in the hospital and doing poorly. In addition, once they're there, we know that dexamethasone and remdesivir are good and clinically proven by randomized placebo-controlled trials, remdesivir to diminish the time to recovery and dexamethasone to significantly diminish the 28-day mortality. I think it's those latter two things that are accounting for a less intense um, involvement with COVID-19 right now. Great, thank you. So um, on people's minds in Maryland this week are uh, the sports seasons. Uh, the governor last week allowed uh, for sports to resume in schools. And a lot of our parents are concerned. Uh, masks are not required. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, athletics uh, restarting within the school systems? Well, you know, athletics is somewhat the same as the schools themselves starting or not. It really depends on the level of infection in the community. You know, we rank on the basis of test positivity, states, cities, and counties, and regions as dark green, which is really good, a very low level of transmission and level of infection. Green, which is good. Yellow, which getting up there. 
orange and red. So if you're in a school district and the teams, the players in the schools are living in a place where the infection rate is really quite low, I think you could, with a relative degree of impunity, go ahead and start the sports, whatever they may be, basketball, football. I mean, the more contact the sport, the more issue you have, as we've seen now with the Titan game that just had to be postponed because several players and staff have been infected. When you get into the red zone, that's going to be problematic because you're going to be, when you get kids congregated together, by the very nature of what they do, they're going to be in physical contact, particularly with football. You're going to have a problem. So I always say the easiest way to get the sports going and the schools open is to do everything you can to get the place where you are living into a color zone that's much more favorable than what you're in. So if you're in orange, do whatever you can to get into yellow and green. And if you're yellow and green, make sure you, you, you stay in green. And if you're yellow, make sure you go to green. You do that, you could start opening up the sports. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. So I got my flu shot this morning. Uh, I was online uh, early on. It was our first day of uh, administering to our, our people at GBMC. So w- what, are we, uh, what are we expecting for this flu season? Our clinicians are a bit concerned about confronting the next wave of influenza as they're still trying to differentiate uh, people who may be sick from COVID-19. Well, I got my flu shot yesterday, so I'm right there with you. Um, There are a couple of things we can do. Uh, And uh, I think there's uh, positive aspects to some past experience that our international colleagues have had. First of all, everybody six months of age or over, unless you have a significant contraindication, should get vaccinated with the influenza vaccine. We know it isn't a perfect vaccine, but it does prevent infection to various percentages depending upon your demographic group. And it also clearly mitigates the possibility of your having to be hospitalized and even dying. So it's clearly beneficial. The one thing that has happened in the Southern Hemisphere, which as you know, has their flu season during their winter, which is April, to the end of August, which is essentially our summer. That's their winter. The Australians have noted something really interesting. They have been very careful in wearing masks, doing physical distancing, avoiding crowds, and washing hands in order to prevent COVID spread. And what has happened is that spilled over to preventing influenza spread. So that in Australia, they have had the mildest flu season in memory. In fact, I've spoken to some of my Australian colleagues and they say they've had almost a non-existent flu season. So I believe that if we combine widespread use and uptake of influenza vaccines together, with the kind of public health practices I'm mentioning, that we could essentially take flu off the table and avoid that confluence of two respiratory diseases at the same time, namely COVID and influenza. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. So I know you're busy. The the last question is kind of a public health question. We realize that at times we struggle with health equity and health care equity in our country. And we know that there are disadvantaged uh, percentages of our society that that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Do you have any guidance for us in in, uh, how we might adapt the system to better help those disadvantaged populations? You know, that's that's a great question, but there's no easy answer because we have failed, not only with COVID, but with other diseases. The the disparity in both infection rate and complications among minority populations, African-Americans, Latinx, Native Americans, Alaskan Natives, Pacific Islanders, 
is very striking. So we need to, in the immediate case, concentrate resources such as testing capabilities and the ability to mobilize people to help get individuals who are in areas where the healthcare delivery is poor to try and help them in the healthcare delivery system. But the real change is in the long range, something that will take decades. And hopefully the unfortunate experience that we have with the disparity currently in minority and COVID-19, hopefully that sheds a bright light on what we need to do in the future to modify the determinants, the social determinants of health, which allow African-Americans and Latinx to have a higher degree of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, heart disease, which puts them at a greater risk. We need to commit ourselves now that in the long run, we need to change that. We're not gonna change it overnight, we're not gonna change it next year, but we can start changing it in a process that likely will take decades. So thank you so much, Dr. Fauci, for those uh, words of wisdom. Uh, you're right, clearly we need to get in action, but it's uh, not gonna happen overnight. So uh, I wanna thank you so much. I've been a huge fan of yours uh, for many years. Uh, we are so grateful that you took the time in your busy schedule to spend some time with me. Uh, our community is grateful to you for standing up to the pandemic and for being, as I said, that voice of uh, reason. Uh, I, I would, uh, we are so grateful to our frontline workers. I know you being a physician and, and uh, being a frontline worker yourself. And I remember the video of you with the uh, 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 Ebola patient. Uh, but uh, we are so grateful to our frontline workers and they are grateful for you spending some time with us today. Uh, thank you for everything that you've given in your career to our country and please keep it up to help us get through this pandemic. We are very grateful. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you. It's really been uh, very nice to be with you. Uh, it was enjoyable. I, I, I hope it was helpful and you enjoyed it and congratulations again on your anniversary of the Greater uh, Baltimore Medical Center. It's just, uh, you know, I've been up there. It's a great place. And congratulations to your frontline workers for the great job they're doing. We'd love to have you come and visit sometime if you're ever in the neighborhood. We'll, we'll do. have an espresso Thank together. There you go. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So it was an honor to speak with Dr. Fauci and to have you join us to view the conversation. Before I sign off, I want to once again express my utmost admiration for our frontline healthcare workers. They've served selflessly since day one, risking themselves even when we had very little information about the virus, because it was the right thing to do for our patients. I also want to thank all of you, our loyal, loyal supporters, for your abundance of contributions to the GBMC Healthcare Workers Fund. This assistance has made a difference for our frontline staff. You've been there for them so they can continue to serve our patients even while their own families are experiencing hardship as a result of COVID-19. Your continued leadership also means we are still on track to expand the GBMC healthcare footprint as we've planned. We've broken ground on Gilchrist Center Baltimore at the former site of Memorial Stadium, where we will be providing safe and compassionate end-of-life care for Baltimore City's most vulnerable patients. We believe everyone should be able to die with dignity, regardless of their ability to pay. We are also proceeding as planned to break ground on the Promise Project, our three-story hospital addition, in the summer of 2021. From the beginning, the Promise Project has been about building on the strength of GBMC's relationship with the community. Now, because of the timing, we're also able to incorporate lessons learned from living through a pandemic. Because of so many of you, we are positioned to build the most advanced facility in our region as it relates to stopping the spread of infectious disease. 
We are taking the lessons learned from COVID-19 and applying them so we can be more prepared than ever before. Thank you so much for joining me and have a great afternoon.